Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. Okay, Pastor William will give the message. Hey, good morning, everyone. So the title of our message this morning is The Basket. It comes from Zechariah chapter 5, verses uh, 5 through 11. Um, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs and uh, pictures of eyes in this passage. And in an uncanny uh, timing that only the Lord does is I actually had eye surgery this Thursday. I had a, I had a cataract in this, in this eye. It was starting to get very muddy and blurry and milky. Uh, and this used to be my bad eye, so I, I, I'd have to, like, always, like, you know, kind of close this eye if I don't need to read something or see something, but now, um, this is now my good eye, and this is now my bad, my bad, this is now my bad eye. This eye is not as good as this new eye, so very interesting that my, I, I had my eye taken out and a new one put in, and now I can see better with my, with my left eye now. So we're going to talk a lot about eyes in today's passage, um, and I think you'll see why. Um, but let's go ahead and read the key verse before we start. Okay, let's go. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said that this is their iniquity in all the land. Okay, let's pray before we start. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we can gather in Jesus' name to worship you. Thank you so much for um, the powerful work that you're doing in all of our lives and the, and the, um, the powerful work you're doing in our church to um, reach out our hands uh, to the, um, those who are lost and to find your lost sheep on the campuses, to um, uh, establish uh, Bible academies and house churches with uh, Joseph and Isa, and also with our Christmas uh, service where we can exalt Jesus and worship him and see all the good things and the great things that he's done. We thank you for all this. Um, we pray that um, we'd be able to see uh, all these good things very clearly and that we can really uh, understand our times and what you're doing in our lives. Uh, thank you for this time and please uh, guide us through this passage and, uh, and really give us one word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the um, verses 5 and 6 to uh, start off. Let's, uh, let's read these verses again responsibly. Okay, I'll go first. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. Thank you. So in this passage today, we are on the seventh vision of Zechariah. And like many of the other visions, we keep seeing this um, expression, uh, lift your eyes and see, and in this case, what, it, what this is that is going out. In the previous uh, expressions, Zechariah was saying, I lifted my eyes. But in this uh, verse, you can see that the angel who was talking with him came forward and told him to lift his eyes and to see what uh, this is that is going out. You know, it's not easy to uh, lift your eyes. Zechariah had been lifting his eyes many times, like uh, kind of like, uh, you know, doing curls, right? He'd been, he'd been doing a lot of curls, and then his, his uh, spiritual trainer came out and said, one more rep, lift your eyes again and see what this is that is going out. Lift your eyes. I want to I wanna, um, give everyone an awareness uh, test. You guys ready for this? 
Okay, so here, I'm going to play a video for you, and I want you to uh, follow this awareness test. Let's see if this works. This is an awareness test. <laughs> How many passes does the team invite make? Oh, come on. Did you see him? It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. Did everyone see it? Raise your hand if you saw the moonwalking bear the second time. Yeah. You saw it the first time. Good job. Okay. I think that, uh, that awareness test has a good message, which is that it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. It's easy to miss something that you're not looking for. You know, when our eyes are looking down, it's very easy to miss something that God is trying to show us. And that's exactly what the, this, uh, these visions about from the book of Zechariah have been about, lifting our eyes and to see something that we could be missing. I want to uh, kind of hammer this uh, point a couple in a couple ways, uh, showing that this is a concept, a very important concept throughout the Bible. So, for instance, um, in the in the Word of God, we see that there is oftentimes a lifting of eyes, and then right after somebody lifts their eyes in the in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, then there's a expression of looking, and then after looking. Then the missing subject, the thing that was missed, is seen. Let me give you an example here. There's, there's a couple from Abraham. So it says here, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look. And then what was he supposed to see? Northward and southward and eastward and westward. He wasn't looking these directions. Here's another example. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Now, just to, let's put a pause here real quick. There was three men standing <laughs> right in front of him, and he, once he lifted up his eyes and looked, then he saw what he was missing. Another one. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Again, Abraham, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. Now, this wasn't just the case for, for Abraham. This is also the case for Isaac. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. He didn't see these camels, but once he lifted up his eyes, then he saw the camels that were coming with his wife, Rebecca. Now, what's fascinating is Rebecca also, and Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. You know, if, you, uh, if you're not married and you're uh, praying about your marriage, uh, I sincerely uh, encourage you to lift up your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's talk about Jacob. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that had mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. And the last one, this is Joshua from the book. There's many, many more of these. Just, just type into the uh, Bible Gateway, uh, lift and eyes. You'll see all the places this happens to people throughout the, the, the Bible. But here's the last one, Joshua. When Joshua is by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. He didn't see that man with the sword. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? 
So with this in mind, let's look again at verse, verses 5 to 6. The angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. In his seventh vision, there was one thing that Zechariah would have missed if he didn't lift up his eyes. He would have missed what this is that is going out. Now, we're going to get into this, into this a little bit more, but I just want to uh, just emphasize the fact that there was something in all these examples that was missing, something that was not being seen or understood. But once the person, uh, the servant of God, lifted up their eyes, then they perceived what it was that God wanted them not to miss, and then they could see it and then take the proper action. We could very well be missing something that God wants to show us, but we have to lift up our eyes in order to see it and then to understand what it is. We don't want to miss out on what God wants to show us because what God wants to show us is the very thing that can bring us closer to him. Amen. Lift your eyes and see. Now for Zechariah, it is what, would, what did God want him not to miss? What this is that is going out. You know, I don't know if you've ever um, opened up your refrigerator and found that there was something very stinky inside of it. Uh, but, you know, this, this must have happened to you at least once in your life. And it's very interesting because you can smell that something is wrong, but you have to look very carefully in your refrigerator to find out what is the thing that needs to be thrown away. You know, um, sometimes uh, my, I have a, uh, some food that I like that, that my wife uh, thinks is, um, is uh, beyond expiration date. And so then she uh, grabs it and then throws it away. And I say, no, don't throw that away. I want to keep that. I want to cook it still. And then she goes, no, look at the expiration date. And she makes me look at it. And then I see, oh, <laughs> this was uh, two weeks old <laughs> past the expiration date. And then I say, OK, let's throw it away. So in the case of Zechariah, lift your eyes and see something that you're about to miss. Don't miss this. Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. Something was going to go out from Jerusalem and from Israel. Something was about to be thrown in the proverbial trash can. You know, usually you don't want to, like, look at things that are being thrown in the trash can. But in the case of this Zechariah chapter 5, it was important for Zechariah to understand and not to miss what was being thrown out of the, of the nation, out of Jerusalem and Israel. So what is it then? What is going out? Well, when we see uh, the next part of the passage, uh, Zechariah also wanted to know what it is. So he said, and I said, what is it? You know, he really, he wanted to know, what, what is it? He said, this is the angel again speaking, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. So the stinky thing that was being removed, the foul thing that was being thrown out was a basket of iniquity. This is their iniquity in all the land. Now, um, I, don't, I don't like to get too deep into um, translations and, and you know, Hebrew words and stuff like that, but this is one time I have to um, do this because this, this uh, last sentence, and he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. You might find a, a little letter next to the word iniquity and it will say something like uh, literally I, L-I-T-I. And the reason why it has that L-I-T, literally E-Y-E, -E, I, is because this word here is the exact same word for, that we see here, lift your eyes. So it really could be said this is their I in all the land. It's the exact same word. It's, it's this word right here, uh, I-N. 
you know, I don't really have a good Hebrew accent, but this is, this is the, the word for I, is ayin. It kind of sounds like I a little bit. So ayin is the word in Hebrew for I, and it's found in many places that you would expect it. For example, in Genesis um, chapter 3, for God knows that when you eat of it, your ayin, eyes, will be opened. And then later on it says, uh, and that it was uh, a delight to the eyes, to the ayin, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the ayin, eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So this word iniquity here is ayin, our eye, usually translated. Now, there's, a real, uh, there's some interesting reasons why they would translate it iniquity, but uh, as you can see in the footnote, it cannot, it's oftentimes translated I. So for the sake of this uh, message, I'm going to use the word I here. This is their I in all the land. Now, just so you know, I'm not being, uh, I'm not being cavalier by <laughs> changing it to I here. It, it's very, um, it's not uh, some crazy idea. But so what was Zechariah supposed to be looking at? He was looking at a basket that is going out. And what was in this basket? This is their eye in all the land. And it was going to be thrown out. When we look at this uh, expression, this is their eye in all the land, we can kind of get a sense that here in, um, in the land, there was a common sort of eye of understanding. You know, when people get together, like in churches or even villages and cities and, and even nations, there's a common eye that develops. What I mean by that is that there's a common view of things. And this can pertain to all kinds of aspects of life. It's a common understanding a perspective, an approach. It is the eye of interpretation of what is good and what is wrong. It's very much a common eye that people develop. For example, um, you know, lots of times people like to uh, sort of pit California against Texas, right? The eye of California is a certain kind of eye it's got a certain value system, a certain perspective on life. You know, it's funny uh, that in uh, the rest of the country, a lot of people think that uh, people in California wear sunglasses all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there's uh, that, that kind of true. Um, but, you know, and then, like, the, the perspective about Texas is that everyone from Texas wears uh, cowboy hats all the time. But the point is, is that when people gather together, they oftentimes find kind of a common denominator or a common eye that everyone is sort of uh, assimilated into. But really, the eye of California, the eye of Texas, is really uh, not that much different when we can think, when we think of it as one of the many eyes of America. But if you compare the eye of America to the eye of Japan or the eye of Nigeria, Australia, Russia, France, now we start seeing seemingly a lot of differences between the eyes that people have. It is some variation, but for the most part, actually, despite the huge spectrum, these are all the same eye. It is the eye of the world. It is the eye that is not God's eye. So the eye in the land, he said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their eye in all the land. And it was going out. God was taking their eye and was going to remove it and replace it with something else. You know, I'm just, uh, like I said, I'm just perplexed uh, by how uncanny God's timing is. <laughs> because, like I said at the beginning, my eye was literally taken out this week. You know, I had a cloudy lens, and then they actually, uh, it's very interesting. I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but they actually go in with a tool, 
and they suck out the cataract. They really remove it. That cloudiness, that, that blindness, it's sucked out. And then they put in a new eye, a new lens into, into the eyeball. It's amazing. As, as I sat there under the, uh, the operating table, I was thinking about this passage. And I sat down there on the operating table, and then they slid me underneath this machine, and then they said to me, Mr. Larson, don't move. <laughs> While we take out your eye. They didn't say that part. But, <laughs> but I sat there, and then this machine came down close, and then some noises, and then, you know, they were sucking out the cataract to put in a new eye. He said, this is the basket that is going out, and he said, this is their eye in all the land. What is the thing that we need to lift up our eyes in this passage and see? We must see that God is taking out our eye and putting in a new eye. He's taking out a very foul eye. Let's look at verses 7 to 8 and see what, what kind it is. Okay, let's read verses uh, 7 and 8. I'll go first. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. As Zechariah uh, continued the conversation with the angel, he, he saw that this, uh, that this basket had a leaden, leaden cover on it. And it was lifted off, and then there inside was a woman sitting in the basket. This was probably very shocking to Zechariah. You know, from the outside, this uh, basket represented the eye. And it was, um, it was the size of about, it's, it's, this, uh, this basket is, is actually called an ephah. And an ephah is a kind of unit of measurement. And it's about the same size as a five-gallon uh, Home Depot um, bucket, more or less. And so this, this EFA, this, this container of, of about five gallons in modern terms, it had a leaden cover on top of it. You know, le leaden is obviously, this was a very heavy cover, like a manhole cover that is not easy to lift off because of the weight. But the, the angel lifted it up. And then inside of this ephah, this basket, this container, was a woman sitting in the basket. And then he said, this is wickedness. So from the outside, it was the eye. But when you actually looked inside of this eye of the land, there was something inside of it. And it was wickedness. Inside was the eye of wickedness. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Now it's evident that this uh, woman is very uh, unruly because you know he just lifted the, lifted the lead, lid for a second, right? It seems like it's a very short period of time. And then he had to thrust her back into the basket, which means she popped out like a jack-in-the-box, like was maybe trying to escape. And so he had to grab her and then thrust her back down and then put the leaden weight on its opening. Kind of reminds us of, um, you know, uh, trying to exit so fast. She's really showing her unruliness. You know, this picture is a picture of, of wickedness being captured. You know, it's not easy to capture wick, wickedness, but it also just wasn't captured. It was contained. And not only was it contained, it was secured. Last week's passage, we saw the flying scroll. We saw that, that God was 
for his people, in order to be close to his people, he was going to provide for them a huge flying scroll that would take up their vision. So when they, when they looked, they would see his, his word, his living word. I think there's a deep relationship between this passage and last week's passage in that what can really capture wickedness? You know, wickedness moves so quick. Wickedness is so rebellious and jumps out of containment so fast. What can contain wickedness? God's word. God's word captures, contains, and secures wickedness in a society, in a heart, in a family. Amen. Amen. God's word, the word that lifts our eyes to see Jesus Christ, has power like a leaden cover to secure wickedness in this world. God really wanted to be with his people. He wanted to be so close with his people. But he needed to capture wickedness in their society. He needed to secure it and contain it so that he, being holy and pure, could be in close, intimate relationship with his people. Our sins separate us from God. Because of sin, it is very difficult, near impossible to have deep fellowship with our Heavenly Father. What do we really want? What brings true peace and joy is that fellowship, but sin gets in the way. And so God's word, working powerfully through the Holy Spirit, captures, contains, and secures wickedness on the personal, the family, church-wide, even whole uh, nation, national level. I have a question uh, that you don't need to answer, but this last week, did you have a chance to spend more time in the flying scroll? That flying scroll has real supernatural power to remove the eye of wickedness and to capture sin, contain it, and secure it. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on his opening. This wickedness was the thing that was going out God was removing it from his people, and it was going to go far, far away from them. Let's look at verses 9 to 11 and see what happens next. Let's read these verses. I'll go first. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it, and when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. Zechariah, at this this time, uh, he lifted his eyes again himself, it seems, uh, without prompting of the angel. And then I lifted my eyes, and he was going to miss something, right? He's going to miss this. He's about to miss verses 9 to 11. But because he lifted his eyes, he saw... And what he saw was two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork. You know, storks have really big, huge wings. They're pretty, pretty amazing. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? And he said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it, and when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. Now, uh, we had a really wonderful uh, men's group Bible study, and there was, there was uh, two opinions about these two women. One group uh, believed that, she, that these two women are agents of uh, you know, darkness or, or evil. Other group thought that these two women are, are agents of God. But I think... Um, we could go either way, you know, 
I, I kind of lean towards their agents of good. But the point is, is that they took the basket out of Jerusalem to Shinar. Shinar is another word for Babylon. He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it, and when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. God is a God of order. This basket, this, this woman of wickedness, this eye of wickedness, didn't belong amongst God's people. This eye of wickedness belonged in Shinar, in Babylon. And so that's where that basket was taken. So we can see in this passage, this seventh vision, that God had in mind that he wanted to remove something from his people, but he wanted Zechariah to see what was being removed very clearly so that he could understand what was being taken out before it was uh, removed. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever had a garage sale, uh, but you know, another interesting thing that uh, interaction I have with my wife, uh, oftentimes when we have a garage sale, uh, I like to just, uh, take some of her stuff and be like, okay, put it by the door. This is going to the garage sale. And then she says, what are you doing with this? This isn't going to go out to the garage sale. And then I look over, and then there's some of my stuff. And I'm like, wait, that's my stuff. You're not going to take that to the garage sale. You know that's happened to you if you're, if you're married. It's important to know and see and understand not only the good things, that God is bringing into our lives, but also it's just as important to see what bad things he's removing. In the case of, of this passage, the Lord was removing the eye of wickedness from the land. The eye of wickedness is really the ways of the world that are in contrast with the Bible, with God's word. God's word produces or presents in another kind of eye, the eye of wisdom. Even in the book of Proverbs, there's, there's two women that are, are shown in, in deep contrast with each other. One is the, the woman wisdom who sits, uh, sits in the, um, at the, uh, the byways and encourages people how long will you simple people love your simple ways come buy from me and then there's another woman the adulterous woman who's shown in the book of proverbs who also is encouraging people to come into her house and then to commit adultery and, and to uh, commit sexual immorality and it says about that that woman that it her paths go down to the to the grave to the depths of shale the Bible has one eye. It is the eye of God's wisdom. But there's another eye that sees, and it's an eye that we see in our world right now. It is the eye of wickedness. And as we read God's word, our old eye of wickedness is being pulled out and being thrown away, and we're getting a new eye that comes from God, the eye of wisdom. Now, I think it's important to um, ask this question. I know somebody's asking this question. Why does this passage focus on women so much? <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, not, there's not a lot of passages that, that have... Um, so, you know, especially in these kind of like heavenly scenes. But I think that there's actually a really positive and good reason why. You know, I was talking to one of my, um, my daughters, and uh, I love to call my daughters. Um, actually, let me ask Hannah and Leah. Hannah and Leah, what, what do I like to call you? Daughters of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> Daughters of Jerusalem, <laughs> do the dishes. <laughs> Daughters of Jerusalem, let's go. We got to go. 
Actually, I didn't understand why I love this expression. They're so beautiful. My, I love my daughters so much. Daughters of Jerusalem. I don't know. It just sounds so good. And it's in the Bible, so I like to see it. <laughs> but I want to, I, I think God gave me some insight. The daughters of Babylon, which is another expression, they're women who have the eye of Babylon. The eye of vanity, the eye of evil, the evil eye. Whereas the daughters of Jerusalem are women, godly women, who do not have the eye of the world, the eye of wickedness, but through studying, repenting, prayer, and coming, most importantly, coming to God's word, have developed the eye of God's wisdom in their life. The daughters of Jerusalem are the daughters who have, the women who have, the eye of God, of God's wisdom. This really brings an important uh, prayer topic. We really need to pray for many young women because many young women are very, very powerful influences. I want to give you another example real quick. Let's, look at, let's consider a couple women who had the eye of wickedness and their husbands. Let's think about Jezebel and Ahab. Think about Ahab. He was a king. He, was a, you know, a, he had his chariots and his armies. He was a big macho man. But Jezebel was like his eye. And because of her influence on Ahab, Ahab became more crooked and more wicked than he already was. And let's think about Delilah and Samson. Delilah also was a woman who didn't have the eye of God's wisdom, but the eye of wickedness. And through her influence on Samson, who was a real powerful man of God, but also a very weak man. You know, just imagine if Delilah had the, the eye of God's wisdom, what she could have done for Samson. But because of her powerful influence and because of her, her eye of wickedness, she was Samson's downfall. Let's think about uh, Vashti and, and King uh, Asuras, you know, Vashti, in a lot of ways, kind of ruined her own life, but she also had this eye of wickedness, and she humiliated her husband in front of all of his friends. And this guy was no special uh, great man of God, but it's very interesting how her eye was uh, an eye that humiliated her husband. Last, uh, Herodias and Herod. You know, Herod was a man who was really on the fence, We've had some good Bible studies on, on Herod uh, at LBCC a couple of times. And Herod was really between two people. He was between his wife Herodias and who was the other person that he was between? John the Baptist. You know, if Herodias would have been a woman with the eye of God's wisdom, she could have helped Herod become a great man. You know, he has spiritual desire. Now, Herod has to be accountable for his own, own life, definitely the case, but we also can't discount Herodias's eye that influenced Herod. Now, on the opposite side of things, let's think about Tamar, Rahab, Esther, and Mary. These were all great women of God who adopted not the eye of Babylon or the eye of wickedness, but the eye of Jerusalem or the eye of God's wisdom. Praise be to God for these great women who are not like uh, in the basket of wickedness. Daughters of Babylon and daughters of Jerusalem. Let's pray that our ministry might find many daughters of Babylon and through the power of God's spirit and his word to transform them into daughters of Jerusalem. Amen.
You know, we have a crisis for men, but we also have a crisis of women. So many uh, young women are being led to develop an eye of this world that is so wicked. I don't, know, I don't need to go into the details because we all, we all know what I'm talking about. So in conclusion today, we learned a couple important things. One is we, we learned the importance of lifting up our eye. If we don't lift up our eye, we might miss Not might. We will miss what God wants to show us. And what God wants to show us in this passage is that he is changing our eye. He's taking the eye of wickedness out of all of us through his word. And every time we sit down with Jesus to read the holy word of God, our eyes, our eye of wickedness is being slowly removed and replaced with the eye of God's wisdom. And so this is, uh, in a, this is the seventh vision of Zechariah. So let's, let's be aware that God is doing this. You know, I've, as I meditated on this and thought about all the, all the times that God was uh, changing me, I saw in myself uh, some resistance. You remember how I was telling about going underneath the laser? There was times where I didn't want to go underneath the laser and have my eye removed and have it replaced with God's eye. I was like, you know running out the front of the doctor's office and avoiding surgery. But this surgery, when God removes our eye of wickedness, is very glorious because of this really important reason. We get closer to God after it's done. We find ourselves one step by step by step closer and closer to God the Father and our Lord, Jesus Christ. So let's uh, be good patients and let God do his good work to remove our eye of wickedness and replace it with the eye of wisdom. Let's read today's key verse. Um, I got the, I got the edited version, okay? So this is the one with iniquity, but we're going to read this one, okay? All right, let's go ahead and read verse 6 together. Okay, let's go. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their eye in all the land. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we can um, come to you. Uh, Lord, we suffered a lot because of our eye of wickedness. Uh, We couldn't come close to you because this eye causes us to sin and to desire things of sin. Um, But your powerful work is to remove this eye of wickedness. Uh, Lord, we really want to pray so much for many um, daughters of Babylon to be uh, found on the campuses of um, Southern California and beyond that might be changed and transformed into daughters of Jerusalem with a new eye, an eye that really um, is uh, truly uh, the eye that you want them to have and, and, the, um, influ- and have the influence that you desire. Uh, thank you so much for your work of your Holy Spirit in all of our lives and in in this church. Lord, we pray if there's uh, any eye of wickedness in our midst, help us to submit and let you remove it from us, that we might be uh, changed and transformed, and most importantly, be able to draw closer to you because of it. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.